Hey, this is Malcolm Andreation. In this video, we're going to look at how to export models and textures from Star Wars Battlefront 2 and load them in Maya or the 3D application of your choice. Okay, so why would you want to do this? Uh, it's pretty common uh, practice in the games industry when a new game comes out that looks good uh, to dissect it and analyze it. Mostly you just end up doing this through looking at screenshots and playing the game. Uh, but I realized uh, with Battlefront 2, you can actually export the models and textures out and load them up in Maya. And this can be handy for analyzing vert counts and examining textures and UVs and just general construction. Uh, I should also mention this process will work in any 3D application. So you don't actually need to use Maya. The tool exports FBX files, so you can use Max or Blender or pretty much any uh, program that loads FBX files. On the texture side, you might be able to use a different program, but I've only researched how to do it in Photoshop. Uh, so let's get into it. So the first thing you need to do is install the game and wait for it to fully download. Uh, the tool won't work on it and uh, unless um, it's fully downloaded to your hard drive first. Once that's done, we need to download three pieces of free software. And of course, you'll need to have Maya and Photoshop installed or the 3D app of your choice that loads FBX files. I will put all of the links in the description as usual, uh, but we need to download the Frosty Editor, which is a tool that can extract assets from Frostbite games. Also grab the normal completer program while you're on the same page. Uh, so you want to get this here, the editor, and you'll also want to get this normal completer tool here. Uh, I'll talk about that later. And uh, there's the link, but I'll put it in the description. And uh, then you'll also want to grab uh, this thing, Intel TextureWorks plugin for Photoshop. Um, again, I'll put the link in the description. So the Frosty Editor and the Normal Mac Completer both don't require any install. Just extract them to a folder on your computer. So you can see here, I just put them on my desktop uh, for the purposes um, of this demonstration. Whoops, there we go. Uh, so it just sits in this folder, extracts there, and then I just put the normal completer in there. It's just its own executable. It doesn't have any associated files with it. The Intel Texture plugin requires you to close Photoshop and copy a single file to your Photoshop plugins folder. How to install the plugin is included in a text file that comes with the download, but if you need help, feel free to post in the comments uh, if you can't figure it out. So double click the Frosty Editor EXE to open the program. And the first time you open it, it's going to prompt you to find uh, the Battlefront 2 EXE. Uh, mine is located here. And uh, just select that and click Open. Um, that's going to take a while to load it for the very first time. Uh, so we don't have to do that because I've already preloaded it. Once it finishes loading, uh, this is basically what the main interface looks like. Uh, so you have your project here. This is Battlefront 2. Here's all the levels and content, sound, visual effects, whatever. Uh, so basically how you browse this is uh, it's just a bunch of folders. And uh, where most of the environment assets are stored anyways is under objects. And then from there, there's subfolders like nature, props. Uh, we're going to be just exporting something kind of simple like a metal crate uh, from Tatooine, I think. And uh, that's under props. And uh, also up here in the filter, you can type a uh, keyword basically to filter out anything that doesn't have that keyword. For example, we're going to type crate because we're looking for a crate and hit enter. And it's going to filter the props folder and uh, just show us things that have uh, crate in the name. So I think the one that we're looking for is in Tatooine. And I think the file that we're looking for is this crate. Yep, that's the one. So for this video, we're going to export this particular asset. So basically in this folder uh, down here, you can see all the different kind of uh, types of assets that are in there. Uh, the easiest thing to do is just uh, click the type to filter this. Uh, so they stack uh, with similar assets together. Uh, so you can see here's the textures for the crate. And then the other thing where the geometry is, is it is in the... Where is it? In the rigid mesh asset. So if you double click any of these assets, they will appear here in the viewer. Uh, this is just Maya controls for the viewer, same that you're used to. Uh, so this is the crate that we're gonna work on. And 
Then also you can double click the texture to see the texture. The reason that you can't see it is because it has an alpha channel. So you can just disable that to see what we're looking at and then double click this guy again and do the same thing. Uh, so that's the diffuse texture there. And that appears to be the normal map there. And this appears to be the mesh here. So to export the FBX, it's actually really easy. You just load it in the viewer here and then click this export button. And uh, I leave these uh, options to be default. They work fine if you're using Maya. Uh, click the export button and it's just going to ask you where you want to save the file. Just put it on the uh, desktop here for the sake of this video. And uh, you just say save and that's it. You're done. You've got your asset exported out and you're ready to load that in Maya. So we'll just switch over and we'll try it right now. So let's go file import. If it fails to import, make sure that you've loaded the FBX plugin in the uh, plugins manager in Maya. So we will just go to the desktop here and we'll put in create test and import it. And there it is. There's our model. So if you look in the outliner, whoops, let me drag that over here. If you look in the outliner, you're going to see like a bunch of stuff in here. And what those are is the LODs uh, for the model. So we don't actually care about these uh, if you're just looking at the art. Well, maybe you do if you're interested in how the LODs are built. But I'm just going to delete those. And what you want to look at is LOD 0. That's kind of the base mesh, uh, uh, the highest res mesh. Just going to unparent that and just delete this as well. Um, so that's the highest res that it's ever going to get in the game. So it's kind of interesting. You can kind of check out what the kind of average vert count is, what they've modeled, what they've baked into a normal map, that, that type of stuff. The tricky part is the textures. So game engines use a file format called DDS. That stands for Direct Draw Surface. It's a format invented by Microsoft in the late 90s. Basically, pretty much all modern game engines uh, compress textures into a DDS file. Even if you use something like Unreal and it says it's a U asset on disk, it's actually a DDS file under the hood. And inside of the DDS, you have a bunch of different compression types. Typically for a diffuse texture, you save it as a DDS uh, file. And the compression you select is called DXT1, which is a really small file with very little compression artifacts. So same thing with the textures, uh, just select in the viewer, click the export button, uh, browse to where you want to save it. And uh, as you can see, it is going to export the texture as uh, DDS and you don't get a choice to do anything else. So oops, looks like I already exported them before. So just export that guy, do the same for this one. And then we're ready to open them in Photoshop. And so if you didn't install the Photoshop plugin correctly, uh, Photoshop will just error out and won't let you actually import the files. Uh, but I did install it correctly, so you can just import them in and it will load them. And you'll want to turn this on because if you find like a tree or something that has an alpha channel, you want to load the transparency into the alpha so you can resave it as a different format. So always, always turn that on. Unfortunately, you have to do it each time. And as you can see now in Photoshop, we can see the diffuse texture for that crate and the normal map for that crate. And you'll see in the alpha channel, it looks like they're either storing the uh, roughness or the specular kind of maybe looks like the roughness. I'm not sure though, I didn't work on this particular game. Um, so I'm just gonna save this diffuse texture as a TGA so Maya can read it. So we'll just go Targa and save it. And I don't care about the alpha channel because I'm not gonna even build a shader in Maya that shows me the roughness or whatever. That's kind of more advanced out of the scope of how much time we have. And I'm going to say 24 bits, so it just automatically kills the alpha channel. And then I'm going to go over to the normal map. And on closer inspection of the normal map in the channels, you're going to see it's got the same thing. It's got the roughness channel uh, or, the, or the specular in the alpha channel. But you're going to notice something else. If you look at the green, it's all good. And look at the, oh, sorry, look at the red and look at the green. They're all good. But if you look at the blue, it's a solid color. And this is bad. This means that if we try to render this normal map in Maya, it's going to look all fucked up. And the reason for this is most modern game engines or a lot of modern game engines, they don't actually store the blue channel in the compressed texture. And I believe this is to save memory and or also perhaps to make the, uh, make the texture a little bit more high precision. Uh, basically what happens is in the shader, it gets regenerated at runtime. So you don't actually uh, need the blue channel in the texture. So 
the pipeline will throw this away. And you might author it in whatever application you use to author normal maps, but when you export it probably through a modern game pipeline behind the scenes, it'll just delete the blue channel and regenerate it in the shader at runtime. Uh, and this is uh, helps us in certain ways. But uh, for this uh, exercise, we need to get the blue channel back. And because we exported this asset out of uh, the game where the channel's already been chopped off or whatever, we need to gen regenerate that. And that doesn't work on TGAs, unfortunately. So we have to save this temporarily as a PNG. Save that and say none and none and say OK. And I'm just going to close this. And now we're going to go to our folder where we have the uh, Frosty editor. And remember, we also save that normal completer exe. So run that now, and you're going to see it's a real basic program. Uh, so it's got R, G, and A. Switch this to B. I don't know why it goes to A. But uh, basically what this does is it regenerates the uh, blue channel of the normal map from the R and G. And in our case, there was nothing in the B, so we want to overwrite that. So you just browse to the texture, which is not there. Let's see. It's in the crate. OK, so we're going to load this guy, PNG. If you try to load a TGA, the software will just say it's not supported. So unfortunately, you have to do PNG. So you load that up. You're going to overwrite that. And you just click the Overwrite button. It takes two seconds. That's done. And now if we go back, where did I put that? There it is. If we go back, you will see when we drag this PNG in, it actually looks to be the right color. And if we go red, green, and blue, see they're all there. So now this is a valid normal map uh, for loading in the Maya viewport. And just for consistency, I am going to save this as a TGA. So we have two TGAs and it doesn't need the alpha. So I'm going to say 24 bit. So we've got our textures saved and we're all ready to uh, create a simple material in Maya and apply them and view this in the viewport. But what you might notice is the diffuse texture is a rectangle. It's 512 by um, 1024. And the normal map is a 512 by 512. So what this says to me is that what they're doing in their game is the diffuse map, or at least some of the diffuse maps, are unwrapped in kind of in a zero to one. And then on this model, the normal map to make it look higher res is unwrapped with stacked UV shells to a second UV set. And then I've also noticed in game just by looking at the assets, it's pretty obvious that everything has like a detail map running on top of both of those that tiles at a higher rate. So what we're going to have to do is build a, a little shader that has two layers in it that hooked up to two different UV sets in Maya to display this correctly. OK, so over to Maya. Uh, this is going to be kind of hideous because uh, I don't have enough screen real estate. I would usually put like the hyper shade on a second monitor or something, but I will do my best so you guys can see what's going on here. So we're ready to load our textures in. So um, let's just make a blend by clicking the blend button there in the favorites or whatever. And we will select that and right click and assign material. So we can see we've got our blend assigned to it because it's got the sheen on it there. And then in the blend, uh, we'll just browse to the color and we'll say a uh, file node. Looks like I already had it typed in there. If you guys don't know, you can type a search in here, which is really handy to filter things. So I had typed in file, to, uh, same as Unreal in the content browser actually. And then uh, browse for the file. And we're looking for the TGA that we saved. So that was the diffuse texture. So I'm going to apply that. Uh, and you can see right away that it's clear that it's using a second UV set because it's all misaligned. Uh, but let's just keep going. So back to the blend here. And then in the bump mapping slot, we will click uh, Browse button. And we're going to do another file node. And you want to set this as tangent space normals because that's what we exported. And then in the bump value is where you're going to want to place the texture. And then it's going to give you another browse option. And then we're looking for the normal map TGA that we exported. So just double click that. And then you can see here in the viewport that one aligns, which is interesting, and uh, renders correctly. And then the diffuse does not. So I'll show you the trick on how you can use uh, different uh, UV sets with different textures. So we don't need this anymore. Our, sh our simple shader is built. So we'll close the hypershade. 
And then I need to show you guys the UV editor, which is also going to be gross. So let me just show you. Let me just get the asset selected here. So in the UV editor, sorry, I'm just going to scale this down. This is painful. Um, so in the UV editor, that's the UVs for the first UV set. And sorry, in the UV toolkit on the right, if you go down to the very bottom, you'll see these dot, dot, dots here. If you pull those up, it will actually reveal the multiple UV sets for the currently selected object. So I've got my object selected, the crate, and you can see I've got the two UV channels. I have UV channel zero, which is the first UV channel, and one, which is the second UV channel. So you can see they do indeed unwrap two different sets of UVs to, on this particular asset for the normal map uh, to tile at a different, or be unwrapped to a different kind of uh, style than, um, than the diffuse. So we just need to determine uh, which one of these guys is wrong. and uh, the normal map looks correct, so that means the diffuse is wrong. So basically, all we need to do is go into Windows, and then I believe it's Relationship Editors, and we are looking for UV linking. And then you can use texture-centric or UV-centric. They seem to do exactly the same thing, so we'll just go with texture-centric and open that guy. And basically, what this shows you is for your material that you have selected on your model, our Blin 1, it's got file one and file two, those are our file nodes. And then these are the UV channels of the shape node or the mesh node um, here. So all we have to do is figure out which one of these guys is uh, pointing to the wrong UV channel. So we can do that by selecting file one and flipping it to UV channel one, which is actually UV channel two. And that fixed it. So in that case, we just got it right, but I'll buy trial and error. So close that down and then now you can see the diffuse UVs are aligned to the correct UV set and the normal map UVs are aligned to the correct UV set. And we don't have the full parity with the game uh, with the uh, roughness map and the specular and the detail map applied. But just to get a basic uh, quick example of what the assets look like and kind of how they're constructed in Battlefront 2, um, that's where we've got to so far. I don't actually know what detail map is applied to this object, so that's why I didn't bother setting up the detail map layer, but we could probably figure out how to get that layer working too if we could find out what the detail map was that is supposed to be applied to this. Um, let me know in the comments if you guys figure out a way to actually map backwards in that um, Frosty tool on how to find out which detail map is applied to this, because I opened, I expanded all the tabs in the shader and I couldn't really see any paths to, uh, to the detail map for this particular asset. Um, we could, we might be able to get the roughness or at least the specular working as well. Um, that might be kind of interesting and fun to, to, to do uh, as a fun little test. Uh, but again, um, uh, let me know if that's something you guys are interested in and we can probably do a second video or just build the shader and just like share it online with you guys. So that was pretty cool, actually. We learned Battlefront 2 uses a detail map tiling at one rate, then a diffuse map, which is unwrapped in the zero to one space, and then a normal map, which has stacked UVs. I already knew they used the detail map from looking at the assets in game, but I wasn't really expecting different UVs for the normal map and the diffuse map. So that's pretty cool. Um, and that's exactly why uh, it's beneficial to kind of look at other people's art and uh, kind of deconstruct them and see if they're using any kind of interesting techniques that you want to bring back into your uh, own pipeline or workflow. And it's always really interesting to look at vert counts in other people's uh, games and engines because uh, I know when I first got into 3D and even uh, some people on forums, uh, this is like a pretty common question is like, you know, how high poly should I make it? And the answer is, uh, how long is a piece of string? Because like it really depends on so many variables that that question is unanswerable. But like if you're making a third person action game and you you want it to run at 60 frames a second and you want it to render at whatever 1440p on a ps4 pro you know you can kind of use those variables to help drive like how high res you're making things and in this particular case we could actually just open up the asset and be like oh okay for this genre of game at this frame rate at this resolution this is the kind of vert budgets that they would use for a uh, crate in the environment for example so it's pretty cool and just remember, every game is going to be different. 
If you like this video, please click the like and subscribe buttons. And if you'd like to support me making more free game art tips and tricks videos, please purchase something from my tiny online store. As usual, all the links will be in the description. If you've got any questions, post them in the comments area. Thanks for watching, everybody. Have a good day.